Hi, welcome to ECTV. I'm Grace Johnston Glick. And I'm Zion Reza. This episode, we will be focusing on the artistic side of Ventura County. We're here with our very own Josh Headley and local artist M.B. Hanrahan to discuss her new work and her art class at El Camino High School. Let's go to the studio with Josh. Hi, I'm Josh here with M.B. Hanrahan, an art teacher at El Camino who has an extensive background in the arts. So, MB, <laughs> tell me, how long have you been uh, in the art field? Well, uh, as a professional, mm -hmm. ever since I uh, mm, graduate school, I started working as a professional, like getting jobs, even though I was still going to school. Yeah. And even though what I have done in my profession has yeah. changed, uh, I pretty much, with a few very short stints of actually working for someone, have been a freelancer solidly, mm -hmm. solidly since 1986. Mm. And I, uh, yeah, well, that, that's a good answer for that. Mm. Do, do you work at any schools or? Well, I am, I like to say that I am the art department at El Camino High School. Oh. That may be a little broad, but really it's a, you know, as you know, mm -hmm. it's a uh, small independent study high school. Mm -hmm. And right now that is my only recurring school gig, which is again, once it's once a week and then the students do the bulk of the, of the work on their own. Mm -hmm. But I've been doing it for, um, I would say over five years now. Oh, over five years. Wow. And what my favorite, uh, my favorite thing about the job yeah. is the story of that I was invited because I was I was painting. Well, I I did a project with El Camino High School and it was still on the campus of um, Pacific High School mm. way back in the day, and so I knew about El Camino. And okay. then also when I was teaching at Ventura College, yeah. I would get El Camino students in my class. Okay. A yeah. lot when I, I was teaching mural painting and like drawing classes, and oh. and the school knew that I was there, and I was very open. Oh. I like El Camino high school students yeah. in my classes, and because they were they were young, and you could get them to do just about anything. Oh, <laughs> huh. sorry, um, sorry. Okay, so anyway, they were young, and uh -huh. the students were very game to do just about anything. Okay. So then I'm painting a mural at Pacific High School, which is still there, may I say, at the entry. And one of the instructors from El Camino approached me and said, we are looking for an art teacher. Would you be willing to do this? Mm. So, and that was, as they say, that was that. And although I still, in a freelance way, go and do murals at schools, that is really my main consistent teaching gig. Mm. Have, you, have you published any uh, pieces of yours? Or? Hmm, that's, uh, I have self-published a calendar and I publish a, <laughs> a limited edition uh, series of holiday cards, self-published, and then I make them, oh. sign them, number them, and send them out to collectors. And actually, 2016 will be 20 years of doing that. Yes. And I am putting together a book as we speak oh. to commemorate that and trying to get some, wow. yeah, and get some gallery shows. Oh, okay. Yeah, so to be... Uh, to be announced on that one. To be announced. Yes. Yeah. Do you have any idea what the title will be, or? Probably Holidays in MB Universe. Oh, okay. Wow. That's <laughs> nice. Well, yeah. no one was approaching me to make their holiday cards, mm. so I uh, I took it upon myself to produce my own line. Oh. Wow. With me as the star. How long do you think that's going to take? Uh, 2016. It's going to be ready. So oh, okay. I've I've started accumulating and amassing the images. 2016. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's nice. I know. Yeah. Well, unless someone asks me, which I'm, I'm looking forward to someone asking me to write the definitive story on M.B. Hanrahan, but it hasn't happened yet, so. Mm. Maybe it'll be a video. Maybe that would be more timely. Mm -hmm. Or an e-book. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, like, important teaching methods that you use? Okay. Um, you know, uh, I, I have been invited to teach virtually for any teaching job I've ever done. I have been invited to apply or invited to teach, so I never, even though I have a master's degree, mm -hmm. Um, in, in art with an emphasis on sculpture, I never pictured myself as a teacher. Mm. Now, interestingly enough, I am someone who has absolutely no problem getting people motivated mm -hmm. to do something, and usually something that's <laughs> my idea, as in why I'm an effective community artist in, mm -hmm. in, say, painting murals, 
being able to, com you know, deftly communicate, like, this mm. is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it, and to organize. Mm. Now, how that translates into teaching, you know, I, I uh, again, I feel that other people must have seen something in me that I did not see in myself, mm. because I'm not really much of a... Uh, institution person. I don't really love like regularity, even as a student. And I was very pro school as a student, but I'd always be sort of, hmm, I wonder how I can get the key to that building so I can go in there on my own time. And mm. I just, maybe that's why I like El Camino. But um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, so I would say that with my teaching style, what I feel I most authentically bring is the fact that I am actually doing, as a professional, mm -hmm. what my student, now many of my students have no desire or interest in being a professional artist. However, they are talking with someone and I am conveying information as someone who actually mm. does it. Yeah. I actually do the things that I teach. It's not like I do them sometimes or mm. I do them when I'm forced to do them. I've usually, as I walk in there that day, I've probably done something sort of like whatever we're gonna, te we're gonna learn that day, yeah. I've done it. And then usually done it for money. Now. Be that as it may, uh, for me, I would find that attractive. So as a student, when I knew that my teachers were not, nothing wrong with the teaching profession, it is a, I regard it highly. I, I feel like I almost not worthy to consider myself mm. an educator, considering the great educators that I know. But I am an active person in the field. I regularly talk about my work, defend my work, sell my work. Oh, wow. And so I feel that I bring real life experience. It's just mine, mm -hmm. you know, but I have the, I feel like I have an authenticity yeah. and that seems to, uh, people seem to respond to that. Mm -hmm. And I can only say that because I still run into students. Oh, and I also don't have any kind of, I don't seem to have a problem with a certain type of person, any kind of type of person having taught again in, correctional facilities, yeah. with really small kids, with adults. My favorite is teenagers. Mm -hmm. So, oh, wow. yeah, my favorite is teenagers. And, um, yeah, I would say that my authenticity is probably what is my most recommended feature as an artist, and also that I teach almost exactly virtually the same no matter what oh, okay. Okay. situation I'm in. Yeah. No matter what situation I'm in, I don't mm. dumb it down, dumb it up. I just am very real and straightforward. and. Um, yeah, I would say that. I, I w that's what I would say. But again, mm. I think you kind of have to ask students about teachers mm -hmm. to get a real feel for what, if that teacher's any good or oh, for what yeah, they yeah. do. So ask your friends. Mm. <laughs> well, you said that you sold art, um, or you sold your art. Mm -hmm. Where do you where do you do that? You know, a lot of my work is is sold on a like a custom. Like I, I'm an action person. Like, oh, can you do this mural? Can you design this for me? So. Again, freelance means that I have no steady job. Mm. But people contact me and they will often throw something at me, a challenge of some mm. sort. Now, occasionally, I do create an object or a, you know, here's a painting, you know, oh, yeah, or here's, painting. here's a drawing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look at these photographs. Yeah. Um, and I do make discrete pieces of work. Now, mm. where do I sell them? Sometimes they're in uh, exhibitions mm -hmm. and there's a price tag next to it. Occasionally, someone will say, hey, we're going to have this sort of artist, handicraft, gallery-ish, you can sell things here, and I will go and do that. But most of the time, my selling is sort of selling a service, or selling myself as someone who can do a service. Mm -hmm. Writing grants, for instance, so like that, and yeah, yeah. No. Oh. okay. Well, thank you so much for your time and your awesome stories. To contact <laughs> MB or for more information, you can visit her website at mbuniverse.com, or the newer one the mbuniverse.com. Thank you so much for your time. Right on. Wow, MB sure has a creative mind, and we can't wait to see what she does next. Coming up next, we have Gabriela DeLillo with Dave Seidler to talk about his passion for a project he and his club are working on. The project's goal is to make toys for the children in time for the holidays. Now to Gabriela. Hello, I'm here with Dave Seidler from the Conejo Valley Woodworkers Association. Dave's participating in a toy making operation to bring handmade toys to needy children across the county. Hello Dave, it's so nice to meet you. Hello. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Awesome, okay. So, tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you get interested in woodworking? Well, my interest in woodworking started out in junior high school. I took a woodworking class and I just loved it. 
Uh, even though I didn't think of it as a vocation, it was more of a hobby. Um, I, at that time, decided that it would really be cool to someday be able to build my own house and every piece of furniture in it. And I thought that that would be a very That's lofty goal to try, but I decided to try and go for it anyway. Uh, I went to college to be a dentist uh, in, after, after high school, and I hated it. I did <laughs> three years of pre-dental and hated every, every day. <laughs> and so, so I dropped out of school and I joined the Navy. Wow. and spent some time in the military and had a time to think about what I really wanted to do with my life. And I decided that I really liked woodworking and maybe I should pursue a career in that. So when I got out of the military, I went back to school and I got a degree in industrial arts from San Diego State University and then was hired to teach woodworking at the Oxnard Union High School District. That's amazing, that's so amazing. And I spent 37 years teaching woodworking and CAD drafting, computer-aided drafting and design. You um, do. You're all over the place, you do. You've done everything. And uh, I pretty much built my own house and every piece of furniture in it. That's so amazing, wow. That's so cool. You can come to my house and build my furniture. <laughs> Hello. All right, so what is the main purpose of the club that you're in? And what's the name of this club? The club yeah. is the Caneo Valley Woodworkers Association. And we're a group of people in the community who are interested in woodworking. And we have monthly meetings and we just, enjoy sharing the things we make and ideas and techniques and things and everybody's a teacher and everybody's a student. That's uh, so it's a cool. great place to meet people that have, have common interests. That's so cool. Okay, so how many members have joined the club so far? There's about 130 members in the club, 125 I think at the last count. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. And does, does it gradually get higher throughout the year? Does it decline or do people lose? It you goes know, up and down a little bit. Ebbs and flows. I think the highest we've had is probably 150 or 160 maybe, and the lowest is probably 108 or 110, uh, depending on the time of the year and people get old and move and things like that, so. Oh, uh, and I know that your group does charity work, and mm -hmm. so what exactly do they do? Well, currently we're working on making toys for the needy and uh, so we all have gotten together on our own little groups and, and decide on what we want to make and then we'll make a bunch of toys. Uh, and they will be eventually donated to the Thousand Oaks Sheriff's Department and they will distribute them to the, to the children that are needy for the holidays pretty much. That's so awesome. And I heard that 70, what were the percentages that 75 go to the children in need of them and then the rest goes to where? Uh, about three quarters of the toys that we give the sheriff will go for the holidays, for Christmas, mm -hmm. uh, Christmas, Hanukkah, etc. Mm -hmm. um, the rest they keep in the cars for the patrol officers to give to people throughout the rest of the year, even though it's not the holidays. You know, kids have birthdays and things happen. And, you know, and that's so beautiful. That's so amazing. That's awesome. And how long have you been doing this? And I've been general? a member of the club for three years now. Uh, but the club itself has been going for about 15 years, and I'm not sure exactly about that, but about that, and they've been doing it all along. Wow. So what are you most proud of building? That's very <laughs> difficult. That's a tough one. That's a tough That's one. A tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I would have to say that my house is my... my really? Your entire house? Mm -hmm. Your entire home? Everything. From the ground up? Yep. That is amazing. That is... Wow. And how long did that take you? Well, I bought a house and then I, that was 1,500 square feet and mm -hmm. then I made it into 3,200 square feet. And then I added my shop and then I remodeled the old part of the house. So I didn't actually build the, the original house. We bought that, but then I just remodeled it and, and added to it. And then you just added the furniture and you went along with it? Mm-hmm. Awesome, that is so awesome. And you said, I was talking to you earlier, you said that you also build guitars and you build, actually, can you show us some examples? Oh right yeah, here? I have some examples of some of the toys that, that we're making this year. Look at that. Uh, we have large cars and the younger children like the large cars and then we have small cars and the older children like the, the smaller cars. And then we have to do something for the girls so we have some little jewelry boxes that are made so the girls have something as well. That's so awesome. And there are actually and lots this of one different right here. things. Oh yeah, please. And what exactly is each one made out of? What type of wood? Uh, these are made out of, the cars are made out of redwood. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular jewelry box is made from oak. Um, yeah. The oak box has been finished. The 
redwood box or the redwood cars are unfinished and mm -hmm. that's so that children can color them themselves they can design yeah you know, and so it's not stained so decorate they can do whatever them they, can they do want whatever with they them. want with them yep. that's so awesome and what is your favorite out of all woods types of wood to work with i love the exotic woods uh, i love rosewood i love bakote i love koa i love the real figured grains burls what's what's the easiest to work with in your opinion well the easiest wood is is not always the best looking redwood yeah, true, is, is, true, and pine are very easy to work with um but they're kind of bland you have to stain them yeah. and color them differently uh but as far as ease of working with them those are probably the easiest yeah and so how exactly did you come about the club and how do they work through giving these or distributing all these toys to kids? How do they have? Well, we um, have one of our members is the coordinator for the yeah. toy drive. And so he talks to all of the members of the group, uh, usually in the summer, okay, in the July or August mm -hmm. and says, okay, raise your hand if you want to make some toys and then they'll pass around a little sheet. So we all sign up for what we want to make. Some of us have workshops where we'll have four or five members come in and work together. Some of us work independently. Um, and then he keeps the, the tally. And then on the 3rd of December is our next meeting. And we'll all bring our toys there and show everybody in the, the club what we made. And then give them to um, the coordinator who will then take them on the following day, the Friday, to donate to the Sheriff's Department. That's so cool. That sounds so fun. Like, I've, are people allowed to join where, whenever? And how, how exactly do you join? The, the club is available to anyone, any age, any gender, doesn't matter. Uh, we love to have as many as possible. And that's part of why we're here is because we'd awesome. like to uh, kind of reach out to the community and get other people who are interested in woodworking to perhaps join our group. Um, that's cool. Awesome. And all you need to do to join the group is to come by one of the meetings or uh, look us up online. There's applications online. You can join online or you can come to a meeting and we'll give you an application. Uh, we okay. charge $25 a year for membership um, and you get a little name tag and That's a few awesome. other little goodies. That's and so cool. Awesome. Well, Dave, thank you for giving us some of your time today. And thank you for the wonderful services you and your club are providing to the community. To find out more about the Conejo Valley Word Workers Association, please visit cvwa.org. Thank you so much, Dave. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you. It's awesome, so awesome. What an inspirational project to help children in need. Adding to the various kinds of creativity available in Ventura County, Brendan Elliott, a local independent filmmaker, is hard at work setting up his production company. Here with the scoop, including Brendan's work, Ethan Messaker and Brendan will be discussing the film world. We are here today with writer and director Brandon Elliott of Bad Penny Productions. We'll be talking with him about the challenges and advantages of being an indie filmmaker in this day and age. Hi, Brendan. How are you doing, Ethan? So what was the first film that inspired you? Actually, the first thing that inspired me to uh, become a filmmaker was the tram ride at uh, Universal Studios. There used to be a break in the ride where they would stop at the bottom of the hill and let you walk through one of their sets. And in that, they would show you different special effects techniques. Uh, then you would get back on the tram and continue with your ride. Once I saw all of the different ways that they were doing things, the way, the way, the way the different movies were being made, that's really what set me in the direction that I wanted to go in. Cool. So that's, that's not very spe um, What's your favorite film in general, then? Favorite film in general is Star Wars. And that's, uh, I think, what got me to love movies uh, as a whole. Empire Strikes Back specifically is, I think, my favorite. Okay. And speaking of Star Wars, um, what is your opinion on the ever-waging war with practical effects and digital effects? Do you think there can be a balance? I think there can be a balance. I'm very much more of a practical effects guy. Uh, I want to see it built. I want to see it happen, especially with the, uh, the technology and the ability that we have to, to do those sort of projects. Uh, I think CGI comes in as a tool, and I think it should be used as a tool. Uh, it can be used to you know, clean up edges, to maybe lift out something that wasn't supposed to be there. But to completely rely on them, I think, ends up detracting from a, from a film. 
And then speaking of effects, um, since you like practical effects so much, what would you say is your favorite kind of practical effect? My favorite practical effect is the, simple, is the simplest ones, the sleight of hand, the, the simple change. Uh, I think that you know, if you want to do a car chase or an explosion, that's fairly easy uh, to, to frame as a director. Uh, on the effects side of it, to set it up, they're very fun to set up, but they're also very dangerous. I think the more clever sleight of hand special effects are the ones that I enjoy most. And then speaking of special effects, um, let's talk about the work you did with the Open Classroom School uh, K through nine. You had a special effects club, I believe. Yes, I actually started uh, a special effects club because some of the students were interested in how movies were made. And we went through and I started te to teach them how to set design, how to design the effect, how to run the effect, and what it took to actually put those effects together. Although I think it showed them a lot of the, uh, the background of what goes into setting up a, a special effect. And then what's your opinion, on the, how do you feel about working locally instead of within the Hollywood system? What kind of challenges does that um, bring to you? Getting started in the film industry is nothing easy. You end up having to really, really buckle down and try every angle that you can. Being in the Hollywood system obviously gives you a lot more uh, contacts not working in the Hollywood system, I have the freedom to do what I want. Uh, there's nobody that tells me when it has to be done, how it has to be done, uh, but I don't have the monetary support, shall we say, uh, that you can get when you're in the Hollywood system. Do you think that's a fair enough trade-off, though? Do you think that that's, that, that that's worth it for the freedom that you have? As a director, I do. Uh, as a director, I very much like to be able to control my own projects and be able to set up my own film. I also think that there is a, a stigma that comes both ways with being an uh, independent director. I think that you need to accept that you're going to be doing it all yourself. Okay. And then um, Bad Penny Productions on that subject. What are some of the productions that you're currently working on in there? Uh, we have a science fiction production that we're working on currently. We're in set design for that, and we're beginning the uh, storyboards. We also have a um, dark reality uh, series that we're going to be starting, and we are uh, currently shooting some scenes for that and uh, beginning costume design on three more major characters that we need to introduce. And then there is also a uh, third production that we have started uh, because we just started uh, um, location scouting for it. Okay. Um, you, going back to the dark reality, um, is that going to be a YouTube series or what plan? You, you said it was a series or? It'll be a YouTube series at first. Uh, we want to get it started uh, just to get it out there. Mm -hmm. We'll have uh, probably five to six minute shorts that'll work itself into a, into a full-blown, hopefully work itself into a full-blown series. Okay, interesting. And so those all kind of seem like very different genres, but somewhat the same. Do you have a favorite genre to work in in general, or do you just love it all? I love it all. Um, I, like, I like your dark reality, your supernatural, because uh, there's so much you can do with it. You can be so creative with it and just make it make sense. Uh, comedy, I think, is also very fun to write in, although very difficult. Uh, we do have a comedy production that is on the stove, but it's not uh, not there yet. Uh, I think that is actually something that I'm probably going to have a lot of fun with, though. Cool. So, film versus digital, uh, in in a sense of film stock or using digital cameras, what is your, what's your opinion on that? Digital cameras have made it very, very easy uh, for independent filmmakers to get out and start shooting, and I think that that's actually allowing for us to see a lot more creativity, and a lot of directors are getting a look that wouldn't necessarily have gotten a look, which for people like me, that's a good thing. Uh, I think that film lends itself to the eye in a, in a much more specific way. And I very much prefer film 
for that reason. I think that there's a reality level with film that you don't get with digital. Uh, but digital's catching up. We'll see. And then let's talk about um, what kind of filmmakers inspire you nowadays. Uh, do, you see, do you see anyone that you really particularly have your eyes set on? Um, well, in the overall, I look at uh, Spielberg, of course, uh, Lucas, of course. Uh, one that I recently got to saw speak was I got to see Kevin Smith. And uh, he, has a, he has a presence. Uh, he commands a presence. And he does it so naturally that you don't even realize it. Uh, and he, I think, is probably one of the biggest inspirations, not in genre so much, but in just get it done. Just go do it. Thank you for joining us. And to get more information about Brendan, you can go and his exciting projects, you can email him at Wraith, that's W-R-A-I-T-H, 1374 at gmail.com. Thanks for having me. Hey, thank you. Okay. Thank you for joining us at ECTV. We hope to see you soon.